This is going to be a talk about uh, the immune system to the rescue. Because, um, as you know, uh, I call this fighting fire with fire. The immune system um, has a lot of the properties that we've been discussing about generation of diversity and evolution and, and uh, memory and stem cells. Uh, we have clonal evolution in the immune system. We have generation of diversity by somatic hypermutation. Uh, we have a system that adapts to a changing environment. Usually we think of that as the environment, exterior environment, but we have the interior environment now about tumors which are evolving within us. Um, and we have memory based on pre-expanded clones and evolved receptors. And we have self-renewing stem cells uh, that are long-lived in the system. So, in a sense, we have a lot of properties uh, built into our immune system that the cancer cells, or the cancer populations, are also using. So if we could get it right, um, tune it right, which we've been trying to do for a long time, maybe within the immune system we have the ability to deal with this heterogeneous um, population of tumor cells that are rising within us. And for a long time, uh, there are some of us who've been thinking this is a good idea, but only lately have uh, people been paying serious attention to this possibility. And by lately, I mean with clinical successes that are pretty uh, amazing, and I'll show you some of those. So this is a serious proposition for how to deal with the problem. I want to go back uh, to, uh, in terms of the description of the heterogeneity we deal with uh, to a, f a figure from one of Gary Nolan's papers that he didn't show yesterday in his talk. Uh, but this is a uh, bioinformatics analysis of um, acute myeloid leukemia um, analyzed with his Cytoff machine with uh, 30 or 40 parameters per cell. And bioinformatically, the data has been organized uh, into clusters of cells that are, that are most re uh, related to each other. So the population can be, uh, can be represented in, in uh, two-dimensional space by nearest relationships built, built on, on all of the data from all of the 40 parameters uh, that are used to generate the data. So here you have the tumor population, if I can get my pointer going. Yeah, here you have the tumor population. Over here are the T cells, uh, the NK cells, and the B cells. These are the normal immune cells. And uh, having organized the population this way, you can then turn off one marker at a time or turn on one marker at a time and ask, how does it distribute within the population? Uh, so uh, this is CD20, and it, and it uh, highlights the B cells down here, and none of the other cells are highlighted this way. Um, this is CD33, uh, a myeloid marker, and you see within the tumor population this gradient of, of uh, expression of that marker uh, throughout the tumor population. Here's C CD34, and here's HLA-DR. All of these are... Uh, used to describe, conventionally describe, the, the leukemia population. And CD33 has even uh, been uh, hoped for as a target of therapy against leukemia, myeloid leukemia, by building antibodies or antibody drug conjugates or T cells that recognize this target. Uh, and yet you can see what would happen if you went against CD33. You would pick off only part of the population with your therapy. It's, this reminds me of the figures we saw yesterday about HER2 new expression among breast cancers that are being stained uh, for decisions about cho choosing the therapy or not. So the heterogeneity is, at the phenotypic level here, is, is quite evident from this bioinformatics approach. So um, through uh, our, you know, some studies that we've been doing on follicular lymphoma, um, we can, uh, and this is with um, Mark, uh, M Michael uh, Green and Ash Elizaday, we've been repetitively sampling follicular lymphomas over time and, um, and analyzing the uh, evolution uh, the, uh, by um, whole exome sequencing compared to the germline gene of the patient, and calling the mutations and cataloging them among the repetitive samples. And by doing that, as you just saw from Carla's talk, you can make a hierarchy of uh, genetic events that happen within the tumor, the history of the tumor, um, going back to the original uh, clonal B cell that is not malignant, and the T14, uh, the BCL2 translocation, which many of us have in our B cell populations, and we don't get this tumor. And then the first inferable genetic event, which is in this case is the mutation in one gene called CREBP, which all of the tumor cells have in the expanded population. So that's the trunk of the tree of the somatic mutation history 
Uh, and then other mutations like MLL MLL2 and some of these other histone modifying uh, gene mutations occur later in the in what we call the the, uh, the branches of the tree. So if I had a drug, um, I'd rather have it be directed against CRABP if it were safe um, than against uh, one of these later mutations out here. But not shown on this on this diagram is the fact that we who manage this disease know occasionally we get a subclone growing out which becomes much more malignant called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And where our therapies against diffuse large B cell lymphoma are much more eradicating of the disease than, than our therapies against follicular lymphoma, current therapies. So we prune this tree by treating with uh, chemotherapy of the, evolved, the eventually evolved transformed to higher grade of malignancy clones, leaving behind uh, the more benign tumor as you were talking about pruning the branches and maintaining the, let's call it the benign tumor state uh, in, in long-term management of the disease. So it's a very good example of what you were talking about, of managing the disease by pruning the more malignant branches that evolve and leaving behind the more benign populations, uh, even though they have these mutations we can call. So none of that has to do with the immune system. Uh, so let's talk about the immune system and uh, a couple of facts that people need to know about how it works. Uh, we have T cells and we have B cells, and we think of uh, B cells as the, B cells are the source of the antibodies that we use. Um, and they are the makers of the antibodies, and the antibodies are therapeutic drugs now in the clinic. Uh, T cells, as you're going to hear from the next speaker, are becoming therapeutic uh, agents in the clinic as well. So T cells, T cells don't recognize the native shapes of molecules. What they recognize are peptides that are on the surface of a target cell. So here's the T cell with its T cell receptor. Here's the target it's recognizing, this peptide here is buried in an HLA molecule, and the peptide is derived from proteins within the cell that are chopped up and proteolytically degraded and brought to the surface, presented on the surface, and now the T cells can see them. So the T cells are really policing. They're policing the body for things that are wrong inside cells, whereas antibodies can police the body for things that are wrong on the surface of cells. And so where are these peptides coming from, from inside the cells? Well, if we have mutations, in, in our tumor in this case. Uh, those mutations are encoding uh, sequences that will eventually find their way into MHC molecules and be presented on the surface. And you're going to hear uh, with the next speaker's talk um, just, how, just how valuable knowing what these peptides are uh, for designing therapies against uh, our cancer cells. So the idea is put forward here by, by the group of uh, Schumacher et al where if you have a driver mutation or just even a passenger mutation that codes for amino acid change, uh, that might be the best reason to do high throughput uh, sequ exome sequencing of our tumors so that we can figure out uh, where those mutations are, what they code for, and then find and make the peptides shown here that can be then assembled into these uh, MHC tetramer molecules that are fluorescent or barcoded with, with uh, multicolors or multi multi-metal reagents to go searching for the T cells that are present in the patient that recognize these targets. And so this is a way of searching. It's a way of find, uh, isolating and potentially growing the T cells from the patient who do recognize these mutations and making them into therapeutic reagents or cloning the T cell receptors and moving them into other cells to function as a therapeutic. So T cells transduce with new receptors. So once you know the T cell, you're interest, uh, T cell receptor you're interested in, you can actually assemble it into, a, into a, a virus that can transduce any T cell to bring in this new receptor that you know sees the target you're interested in. And this T cell now becomes a therapeutic, uh, potentially, for the, for the cancer. Uh, another variant on that idea is to make antibody uh, recognition units and assemble them into, into uh, transmissible uh, uh, vectors that transduce the T cells with a, with a receptor that has the recognition unit of an antibody molecule, but the signaling domains of a T cell receptor, so that you can make these uh, viruses and then transduce anyone's normal T cells uh, with these new receptors and, and give them a new specificity that you know you want them to have, in addition to the specificity that they have on their own. So these are Chimeric, chimeric antigen receptors based on antibody recognition units or T-cell transduced T-cells based on T-cell receptors that you pre-identify 
uh, you're interested in and want to train the immune system to use. So you're going to hear a lot about these strategies. There have been a lot in the popular press, the New York Times, with this strategy, for instance, and even this strategy, with very dramatic results in the therapy of patients with cancer. Uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is that this is a custom therapy made for each individual patient. So every patient needs their own T cells re-engineered one way or another to make this work. Uh, so it's a product made for an individual person. Uh, not so easy to make, but people are, are working hard on trying to streamline this process. This is a customized therapy made one at a time for each patient. So maybe altogether we've heard about um, maybe a couple hundred patients um, uh, having been treated in these various ways so far. But the real story in tumor immunology and tumor therapy, uh, immunologic therapy has come from a more generic approach where we know now that there are signals of the T cells we have that may be in our body recognizing things, but they've been impeded from, from acting by uh, inhibitory receptors that are on their surface or activating receptors that potentially be used to uh, push on the gas pedal. And now we have for each one of these targets that are listed here, uh, we have antibodies in the clinic being tested for their ability to block to, to push on the gas pedal, activate through these receptors, or uh, block the inhibitory receptors um, to take the brakes off the T cells that are in our body already. And this, uh, we would not have predicted would be a safe thing to do, because T cells, of course, can recognize things we don't want them to recognize. They can recognize normal structures in the body and cause autoimmunity. And the surprising thing is that this is safe enough, this has been safe enough to get one drug already approved, the antibody against CTLA-4, which really changed, uh, was really a sea change in our thinking about, about uh, how to use the immune system to attack cancer. And now, even more impressively, and I'll show you data for both of these, uh, antibodies against the PD-1 uh, negative receptor that blocks the negative signal uh, to the T cell coming from the tumor cell. So this is a generic approach. This is an off-the-shelf approach. Uh, these antibodies are available. They can be in the, in the pharmacy. We can write a prescription for them someday and combine them in, in interesting ways uh, to uh, retune the immune system that's already present in the body uh, that's being inhibited and not acting against our tumors, but has the ability to evolve and to mute, mutate and, and maybe keep up with the, with the heter heterogeneity of the tumor population. So uh, here's an example, if, if those of you who haven't seen this data, that's uh, incredibly impressive, I think. This is the uh, combination of two of these antibodies, one against CTLA-4 and one, one against PD-1, to, to, to take the brakes off and to push on the gas pedal, that's called. These are both thought of taking the brakes off in, in two different ways. And these are spider plots that show what happens to, a, let's say, a patient with malignant melanoma here shown with the arrows and how that is regressing simply by doing this immune maneuver by taking the brakes off an immune response that we didn't know was there before. And we're not identifying the target here of the immune response. We don't know what the engines are. And we don't even know what those T cells are and where they are spatially uh, located in the body. Just by globally affecting the immune system in this way, we get tumors regressing, and here's a whole series of patients, uh, one by one, regressing their tumors. And the amazing thing about this is the duration of benefit these patients are getting. Uh, going for long periods of time with regression of their tumors. And the other thing that's really interesting is that we have this phenomenon called pseudoprogression, where it looks like with these little red triangles here, the patients have actually escaped the therapy, developed new lesions, but as they're continuing to be treated, uh, they go uh, progressively into a remission, despite the appearance of what looked like escaping tumor uh, uh, sites in the body initially. So it turns on our turn in the, the doing of clinical trials now where we do an x-ray and find something bad happening. That's usually a cause for termination of the therapy. Uh, now with the so, pseudoprogression phenomenon, it's really a cause for continuing the therapy to see what's really going to happen over time. So this is malignant melanoma. And we've talked a lot about melanoma, and it's been the poster child for immunotherapy. But what about lung cancer? This is the real shockeroo, I think. This is lung cancer. This is uh, 
um, a series of patients collected from a series of trials recently presented at a meeting um, in Europe uh, showing a waterfall plot of patient by patient what happened to their tumors. And so the ones that go down are the patients whose tumors are shrinking, and the ones that go up are the patients whose tumors are growing. So we have a lot of people with lung cancer responding by shrinking their tumors, and some of them for long durations of time, just with this single antibody against PD-1 blocking that negative signal to the T cells, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, whichever antigens they're seeing, without pre-identifying the antigens, with a therapy that's off the shelf. So this is a couple hundred patients here. Just this, with this one antibody, we have about six or seven of them in the clinic now being tested. So we have maybe thousands or tens of thousands even of patients who've, who've received these therapies already in these clinical trials. And so in green here are shown the patients who've never had any other therapy for their lung cancer. And in purple are shown the patients who have had other therapies and recurred from those other therapies. And so here are the survival curves of these patients from these trials. These are here in green, overall survival of lung cancer patients being treated just with a single agent that takes the breaks off the T cells. Uh, and here are the purple ones, the ones who've had prior therapies, or overall survivals. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll ask a question. Joel, is Joel still here in the audience? Yes. Is there any reason why uh, every lung cancer patient in the world shouldn't get this single antibody? $12,500 a month. Well, what do other, other therapies cost that we do? They're, How does that compare? They're, they're all expensive. None are FDA approved yet. Although right. uh, pembrolizumab was just FDA approved for melanoma. This drug, so yes. Is, is this, uh, this, is, this is the pembrolizumab. Is the pembro yeah. 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 So Yeah, I, I agree with that, that decision. Um, predicting who's going to benefit from this turns out to be pretty hard. Uh, no, this is not a randomized uh, control. This is a phase two study of uh, looking for eff evidence of efficacy without comparing it to. But uh, Joel will tell us that, uh, is this a, you think this is a good result? So, so bottom line is probably all patients should have the opportunity to get this, should have the opportunity to get chemotherapy, and hopefully we'll have targeted therapies for that's, that's exactly the theme of my talk. Well, I'll come to Okay. Yes. Oh, because, well, um, they're, first of all, they're in worse shape. They've failed. Uh, they have lung cancer. They failed uh, an attempt to treat them already. So they start out uh, a little bit behind the eight ball. Uh, but there may be some other reasons as well. I don't know, more subtle reasons. Okay. So this is, this is I would say that we're, you know, you, you talk about a free fall. I think we're in a free rise right now. We don't, we don't yet know how good this is going to be. We don't know when we start combining it. This is a single agent, an antibody, that takes the breaks off T cells against targets that we can't even name. And not even combined, as Joel was just saying, with other therapies that are also effective. So we're in a free rise, and I think there's a sea change now in, in clinical cancer therapy based on uh, tickling the immune system. So now I want to talk about another maneuver, one that we're doing here. Uh, it's an old idea. We call it in situ vaccination. So what we do here is kill some tumor cells, not all of them, just some of them, so they spill their antigens. And into the same site where we do that, we inject a, an agonist for the immune system for T cells called uh, the toll-like receptor, uh, in this case, number nine, for those of you who know. So we inject into the, same, into the tumor microenvironment and stimulant of the, of the host immune system while we're killing some tumor cells in that same uh, location. And then we look for and we see a systemic T cell immune response woken up in the patient and systemic regression of tumors by this local maneuver. We don't need to pre-identify the targets, the tumor antigens, and the therapy is off the shelf. So this is something very um, amenable to widespread use. So here's the diagram. We do this by a little bit of radiation to one site. This is lymphoma, but it could be any, any kind of cancer. We do it in lymphoma where we radiate with a low dose to kill some tumor cells just in one place. And into that same place, we inject the stimulant of the immune system. And we look for uh, what happens to the, 
not only the treated site, but also the untreated sites. And here's an example of a patient being treated that way, where we're, in, uh, we're treating a, a lymph node on the back of the neck, and he has other sites of disease, including um, where the arrows are pointing here uh, under the armpits. This is a CT of the chest. And over time, 12 weeks and then 24 weeks, we have a complete regression of the measurable other sites of disease merely by triggering the immune system this way in one place. So uh, uh, what's coming now, I think, is combinations, and combinations of maneuvers uh, to deal with the heterogeneity uh, problem that we're dealing with uh, to not only target, as Joel was just saying, uh, getting the immune system revved up and specifically against the tumor, but also using agents that kill the intrinsic signal, the cell intrinsic signals in the, immune, in the tumor uh, by uh, critical survival pathways that the tumors depend upon. So combining a tyrosine kinase inhibitor with in situ vaccination, uh, and these are the people who are working on this. This is an animal model, but I think it, it's a really easy thing to adapt to the clinic. So the interesting thing is the tyrosine kinase inhibitor that we're working with is one that was thought to be specific for lymphoma. Uh, this is the diagram of the small molecule that is now called a brutinib. It's an inhibitor of this enzyme called Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is in B cells, and a critical survival uh, pathway member for B cells and B cell malignancies. The drug was just approved for a treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And it's, a, a real, it's not Gleevec, but it's pretty close. Uh, it's a really good drug. It's an oral agent, and it is very effective for B cell malignancies. It turns out that it doesn't just hit BTK. Uh, here's a, a kind of a diagram of, of tyrosine kinases, and this is the target, the nominal target of this drug. But uh, it's an irreversible inhibitor of the enzyme of BTK, but it also is an irreversible inhibitor of some other very interesting tyrosine kinases. And uh, it's, an, it, it's a reversible inhibitor of even more, and the ones circled here are the ones that are present in T cells. Not B cells, but T cells. So we have our target in B cells here, but we have targets in T cells as well. So the drug seems to alter the, the T cell balance of, of effector and regulatory and different kinds of T cells in the favor of attacking the host. And so, uh, is that a planted question? Do you work for pharmacocyclics? Very interestingly, this drug is, uh, is very um, mild, um, mostly devoid of side effects. It's an oral agent, and uh, like a lot of surprises, it's a surprise that it doesn't eliminate normal B cells or normal T cells. If you look at the numbers in the blood, it doesn't seem to alter them. But the malignant B cells are very dependent upon, dependent upon BTK. Uh, but the immune system seems to be tunable by this drug uh, with impunity so far. So. In an animal model, uh, here with tumor on two sides, same tumor on two sides of the body, if we inject the immune stimulant into one side, we control the growth of the tumor on that side, but not the other side of the body. But, and with abrutinib, the drug alone, we slow the growth of both sides of the body, but the two together uh, blow away the tumors on both sides of the body and cure the animals of this uh, malignant uh, lymphoma in this case. So this is. This is not so counterintuitive. We have a drug targeting the, t the tumor. We have, a, we have a therapy that trigger, triggers the immune system uh, by in situ vaccination. But when we move away from tumors that have intrinsic sensitivity to this drug uh, themselves, where we uh, go to solid tumors, uh, combining, uh, combining these therapies with this drug, we get the same kind of results. Here's a breast cancer model where we're combining the drug abrutinib with the checkpoint blocker, NTPDL1 in this case, where we're delaying the growth of the tumors, but more importantly, we're preventing uh, metastases in the lung from this breast cancer model. And here with a colon cancer model, uh, this is a transplantable colon cancer in, in syngenetic mice. Again, uh, the blocker of the immune system, uh, inhibitory signals of the immune system, plus the drug abrutinib, the, the two together, uh, uh, are very synergistic in terms of, of uh, the animal model. These are easy things to do in the clinic. We have a drug already in the, in the pharmacy. We have a drug about to be in the pharmacy. And so this is something that I really see on the horizon for uh, 
redirecting the immune system we have with an off-the-shelf combination of therapies that, that target various parts of the tumor survival pathway, the immune system activation pathway, and retuning the immune system uh, with an oral agent and, a, and an infusible antibody. Uh, here are the survival curve of these animals uh, that are, have the combined therapy. So not only in the nominal targets of these drugs, but in the off-target effects on the immune system, we might be able to extend this to the therapy of solid tumors to in, in even enhance the effects of the single uh, checkpoint blocking antibodies and make them even more effective. So, uh, so what we all hope for, a lot of people show this diagram, is if, if uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors can, can extend survival but eventually fail due to uh, uh, tumors being smart and, and evolving uh, resistance mechanisms, and if the uh, immune checkpoint blockers can do this, uh, putting them together maybe can do this, and that's what, obviously what we hope for with all of our combined approaches to dealing with the tumor heterogeneity problem. Uh, so I, 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 yes? First the tumor develops, then we start the, uh, the therapy uh, to be a better model for therapeutic power. Uh, this is not a preventative strategy, although you, one could design such experiments. This is a therapeutic strategy for well-established metastatic disease. So uh, I think uh, I'll stop there and, and uh, we'll maybe have some discussion. And, and uh, I think uh, I've teed up the next speaker pretty well in terms of what he wants to talk about. So thank you very much. Excellent presentation. In your animal models, even with the combined treatment, you still had some failures. Could you identify why they failed? Yeah, a failure analysis is something we always need to do. And uh, actually, I'm more interested in doing that in people. So we are embarking on repetitive sampling of, of the treated site and the untreated sites, and uh, especially the progressing sites. Uh, we can do with fine needle aspirations we can get enough tumor cells to put in Gary's machine and get 50, 40 or 50 parameters per cell in high dimensional space and analyze all of the uh, identifiable subpopulations within the tumor microenvironment, uh, particularly the free floating cells that aspirate out, like the immune system cells. So, in other words, in your mice, you don't know why they fail? Uh, well, we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have retreated the successful mice and we know why they succeeded. Uh, they are immune permanently to that tumor and not to some other tumor. So there must be antigens in the tumor that they succeeded in eradicating uh, that they're remembering to recognize. And that's even true in the brain. When we have tumors in the brain that we've eliminated, the brain remembers, the immune system in the brain remembers to re-challenge in the brain. But in terms of the uh, answer your question directly, the escaping tumors uh, in the mice we have not analyzed. But as I said, I'm much more interested in in learning that in people, and I think we're going to do that. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess that was my question, really. What do we know about escaping? So tumors that initially respond and then escape, what, what mechanisms are sort of out there that have been discussed? I haven't seen anything published yet on this. We hear fantastic data on response and prolonged PFS, but very little on acquired resistance. So in terms of the uh, checkpoint blocking antibodies and, and their clinical responses and then eventual failures, uh, there's a lot we have not heard about yet. We've, we've not heard about what the targets are that the immune system is seeing in the first place. Yeah. And we've not heard, I don't think, anything about the escaping tumors in people. Uh, but maybe, maybe with that analysis, that'll give us insight into what the targets were. Because if we see escapes with certain targets being present uh, uh, and certain other targets being eliminated, well, that will be able to infer what the T cells were seeing in the first place. Yeah. But those are... Those are, uh, I'm, I'm too, I'm waiting for that data. Uh, as we go to meetings now, suddenly the immune therapy sessions are standing room only in the yeah. national meetings, uh, where they used to be echo chambers in the past. <laughs> and uh, there's a tremendous excitement around that. I think this, the clinical success here has outstripped our, our scientific knowledge. Yeah. Uh, who would have guessed that lung cancer is an immune responsive tumor? Yeah. We never That's amazing. That it's amazing. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is that, I mean, at, at ESMO last week, they had data in lung cancer that shows that patients um, do progress through therapy, and, that, and, and they progress, you know, reasonably quickly, faster in lung cancer, at least anecdotally, than, than in melanoma. And I, 
I'm wondering what the basis of that is, um, that you know, many patients have progressed by eight, or nine, eight to nine months on therapy. They have initial response and then develop acquired resistance. Now, I'm not, not aware of similar data in melanoma along those lines. I mean, is that something you're aware of, or is that just my, you, my uh, impression? Paul, have you heard anything about this? It's the silence is deafening on the analysis of what's yeah. going on to explain both the responses and yeah. the escapes, as yeah. you're, as you're yeah. uh, asking for. I, too, am waiting for hearing more information okay. about Thanks. this.